Good day, Sahrani. This is AAN, covering your world. It is 12 o'clock, and our story at the top of the hour now is a heartbreaking story coming out of Central Africa, where we got to sit down with a local warlord by the name of Jackal. Our wartime correspondent, Ruben, was able to arrange this meeting. However, the Jackal refused to have his image put on the air. The following footage is never-before-seen footage of the collapse of Central Africa. All of this is unaired footage, which was shot by Ruben himself. Viewer discretion is highly advised. Why Africa? People need weapons all over the world. Why here? Why my home? Every place is somebody's home, pal. But it doesn't stop people from going to war. I don't start wars. I didn't start this one. It seems like it's your fellow Africans that want each other dead. Besides, why should I give a shit about your home? Why should anyone? You want me to go somewhere else? So there's someone's home you don't give a shit about? What if it was your home? War is my home. Have you ever refused to sell weapons to anybody? I'm a humanist. I don't judge. Maybe you would. I couldn't sell arms. Bullshit, Ruben. You have all the skills to be an arms dealer. Better one than me, even. You're smart. You're creative. You're a salesman. <laughs> you sold me on doing these dumb interviews. Man, the rest is just paperwork. I mean, I'll be unable, psychologically, to sell arms. I'm talking facts and you're talking theory. You're not a good person, Ruben. You've just been lucky enough. You've never had to be otherwise. When it comes down to it, what a man can do is what a man will do. But believe what you want. How do you become an arms dealer in the first place? Back in the Navy, we delivered guns all over the world, dropping off guys with 20 crates of rifles for the local fighters so they could knock over some dictator. Mind you, that's not 20 crates of factory M16s. These were illicit weapons confiscated in some raid and then redistributed. No paperwork right. If a crate here or there goes missing, hey, it happens. Military teaches you two things, how to deal with bureaucracy and how to avoid it. Learning how to avoid it means learning how to deal in arms. You muster out, you apply what you learned. Every gun runner I ever met got his thought that way, losing illicit weapons and transport with national militaries. Why arms? Why not car parts? Radios? What's the difference? Same job, really. You get up, you get on the phone, you meet your clients, you discuss a fair price, you make a delivery, and receive payment. Sounds boring, but it's not. It's just simple. I'm doing what men have been doing for thousands of years, trading one thing for another. If it's you who wants to attach morality to it, make it evil. Insane. People who work in gun factories in Belgium or the States, they're unionized, right? You think kids making radios in Bangladesh pull down 40 grand a year on a 40-hour week? You start thinking too much about morality. That's insane. Do you ever choose sides in a conflict? I did it once. It was a bad idea. Cut my profits in half. Almost got me killed. Never again. You sell to both sides. You can up-level the field, stabilize the market, draw out the conflict and make more money. A big sale to one side doesn't generate repeat business. Both the APR and the UFLL are using my weapons. Now they're in detente. Where do you get the weapons? It's a romantic notion that they all came out of the Soviet Union after the collapse. That was a windfall back in 89, maybe through 91, but that's all over. I move weapons, I profit from circulation. You get a ceasefire in Liberia, both sides disarm. You think they slag 2,000 tons of guns? No. They sell them to me. I resell them wherever the next war is starting. Those same Soviet guns from 1989? Oh, that's about half. The rest mostly come from old European armies. After they abandoned their colonies in the 60s and 70s, you know, French guns, Dutch, Belgian. So some of these guns are very old. They've been sold, bought, and sold repeatedly. <laughs> They're not biodegradable. Only the dead are biodegradable. But it's anarchy. Thousands are dead. Hundreds of thousands are displaced. If I pick sides, few will be displaced, but more will be dead. And I would probably be one of them. You see these APR kids or UFLL kids or whoever's listening to these damn broadcasts, glassy had little shit shouting out in support of whatever propaganda, lies, bullshit's being spouted at them. It's absurd. These guys are already dead. They're blowing each other away for someone else. Tembosa, Mbantue, UFLL, APR. There's no popular resistance, no liberty or labor. There's no ideology at all. There isn't even a desire to win. There's no sense in it. No sense in it at all. What would it matter if we butchered the lot of them? Would it change anything? A little skirmish broke out of this roadblock when some APR guys got lost in the truck. Maybe five or six of them trading fire with the UFLL guys man in the CP. Went on for 20 minutes. Guys popping up from behind rocks to spray a few shots. You know, random at each other. All of them almost too afraid to die. I went down and had a look around. The guy had been shot through the stomach. A bloody mess. He saw me and went at me to finish him off. Funny how guys get shot because they're too afraid to die. And, and they're lying there dying in there. They're too afraid to live. 
And what if you have to kill ten, or a hundred, or a thousand? What if in doing it you save a thousand, or you spare ten? What if you save yourself? What is the measure of a man, or of his murder? By what insane calculus can we answer questions like these? Should we even try? I'll tell you what's sick. People in the UK, in the US, fucking Canada, Sweden. They pay their taxes and some remote piloted drone fires a missile into a public market to hit some warlord. Yeah, so maybe war doesn't happen for another six months and the price of their gluten-free sorghum bread stays low. It's not sick to arm people. It's sick to bump off their crooks and dictators in protection of our interests and then call it international justice. These people don't have remote piloted drones got in their interest 10,000 miles away. They don't have a war machine paid for with taxes. Where I am, they usually don't even have a fucking government. The drone is the oppressor. The gluten-free sorghum bread is the oppressor. The AK-47 is the great equalizer. I empower these people. What do you think you're going to achieve with this interview? You think somebody in the Pentagon's going to read and come after me? Shit, no. I'm a necessary evil. They want me here. They're glad I'm here. Because if I wasn't, they might have to come try to stem the tide. It would be thankless and worthless. And once the bodies started coming home in bags... They're screwed. A dead 23-year-old from Iowa gets more airtime than the death of 50,000 people he gave his life to protect. So even if they did give a shit, their own media prevents them from taking action. Pray for those affected by this human tragedy. This has been AAN, covering your world. <laughs>